This is a 1989 Buick Riata, and it's the rare, interesting luxury coupe you've probably forgotten. It's also filled with some crazy 1980s technology, so get ready, because today I'm going to review this car and show you what the future looked like 30 years ago, at least according to Buick. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my new online enthusiast car auction website for modern cool cars. If you're looking to buy or sell something cool from the 80s and 90s and up, Cars and Bids is the place to do it. Right now, live for auction on Cars and Bids, we have this and this and this and this and a lot more. So if you're looking to buy or sell a cool modern car, check out Cars and Bids by clicking the link in the description below. I've borrowed this Riata from a viewer here in San Diego, and I'll start with the basics. The Riata was a luxury, sporty two-seater that was sold by Buick from 1988 to 1991. Initially, you could only get the Riata as a coupe, but later they also came out with a convertible that was much rarer. Unfortunately, the Riata wasn't much of a success. Buick envisioned it as a halo car that would bring people to the Buick brand and set the direction for the company and sell 20,000 units a year. But by the time production ended, Buick had sold only 21,000 units in four years. Part of the problem was performance. Every Riata was front-wheel drive with a four-speed automatic transmission and a V6 that made about 170 horsepower. So it wasn't exactly thrilling. But it was high-tech, at least according to the standards of 1988. The Riata was intended to be the car that showed Buick buyers what the future had in store. And this car had technology that no other General Motors vehicle had at the time. Frankly, that no other car had at the time. The thinking was that Grandpa would walk into the Buick dealer and he would be wowed by the Riata sitting in the showroom floor with its cutting edge technology and its elegant styling. And he would be so impressed with the direction of the Buick brand that he would buy a Regal or a LeSabre. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. In these days, it's hard to find a nice Riata, or frankly, any Riata at all. But today, I'm going to take you on a tour of this one, and I'm gonna show you all of the interesting quirks and features from the hotbed of General Motors technology from 30 years ago. Then I'm gonna get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. All right, I'm gonna start the quirks and features with the quirkiest feature, one of the craziest things I've ever seen in a car, and that would be the touch screen. This car came out 32 years ago, but this is a factory installed touch screen put in by Buick when this car was new, and it works, and it works well. So let's go through it. What you're seeing here is the home screen, which Buick calls the summary screen, and it shows your most important items. For example, your most frequently used radio controls. You can raise or lower the volume and seek through radio stations. And yes, you can see that as I tap this screen, it actually works and responds to my tap with pretty much no delay. Also on this screen, you can do various other items. You can switch between AM and FM radio, for example, and you can change the climate control temperature, cooler or warmer, all of that sort of stuff that you might want to do the most frequently is on this summary screen. You will also see lower on the screen is the date, and this is indeed accurate. This 32-year-old car was programmed to be able to have this date still working in 2020, and it works beautifully. But the summary page is just one thing this screen can do. If you'll notice, positioned around the screen, there are six different buttons, and each one of them pulls up a different screen. For example, in the upper left, you have the climate button. If you push that, you have a more comprehensive climate control adjustment on here. You can put on the defroster, you can choose where you want the air to go, you can change the temperature, all sorts of typical climate controls you'd normally have in a car, but now they're in this touch screen. To me, 
though, the very best climate control, maybe the best part of this entire touchscreen is the fan speed graphic. You can see this fan is twisting in the upper right to let you know that the climate control is on. If you put the fan on high, the fan graphic actually speeds up to correspond with the higher fan speed. If you put the fan on low, the fan graphic actually slows down to correspond with the lower fan speed. That is just great attention to detail in this touchscreen. But of course, there's more to this screen than that. The button in the lower left is marked gauges, and if you press that, it will pull up your gauges because this car doesn't have a traditional gauge cluster behind the steering wheel. More on that in a minute. But as you can see, the gauges screen shows various different items in real time. You have your oil pressure, your battery voltage, your engine temperature, and my personal favorite, your tachometer, which updates in real time. As you rev the engine, it actually shows the engine speed climbing in this digital tachometer in your Riata touchscreen. And next we move on to the button in the lower middle. That one is called options and it is quite interesting. When you press it, you have three different options. The first one is trip computer. This doesn't function like a normal trip computer. It's better than that. When you set off on a drive, you can enter how many miles the drive is. And then whenever you visit your trip computer page, it will tell you how many miles you have left to go. You can do the same thing with time so you can tell how long you have left in your journey. In the days before Google Maps and all sorts of map apps on your cell phone, this was a pretty good idea to keep track of how much longer you still had on a long journey. Your next choice on the option screen was your trip monitor, which would show you simple things like your fuel economy and your range until you ran out of fuel. Although my very favorite piece on here is the overspeed alarm. If you pressed on that, you could set an alarm that would beep every time you went over the speed limit. Unfortunately, this car does not have traffic sign recognition like modern high-tech cars. Instead, you entered the speed limit manually <laughs> And that way it knew when to start beeping and that was your overspeed alarm. And finally, the last thing in the options tab is a reminder. This one is very unusual. You press on that and you can choose like three letters that best sum up a reminder that you wanna set. Then you can choose how often you wanna be reminded, once, weekly, monthly, yearly, whatever. And then you could program it to remind you every week, month, year, whatever on a specific date. So maybe if you are prone to forgetting your spouse's birthday, your wedding anniversary, anniversary or some weekly task you had to do, set a reminder in your Riata touchscreen and your car will remind you. And next up, the button in the lower right of the touchscreen was your status button. Nothing particularly interesting in here. It just allowed you to configure various different general settings. Like for example, you could go in here and set the clock if you want to, to whatever the current time is, pretty standard. And you can also set the date in here, and that's how the car knows what day it is. This also gave you the option to set the brightness of this center screen. You can make it dimmer or brighter, of course, depending on what you wanted to see, nothing crazy. You could also set the tone for the screen if you wanted it to beep or not beep every time you push it. And using the status menu, you could also run a diagnostic check and the car would check various systems and let you know if everything was good, pretty standard. But in my mind, the best of these screens is controlled by the button in the upper right, and that would be radio. Now, if you push that, you go on to the radio control screen, and you'll see some familiar items in here. You have volume, you have seek for the track, you have your radio presets along the bottom, nothing particularly crazy, but this car came with a cassette player, pretty standard from cars from this era. But if you look down at the cassette player, you'll see there's no way to open it. How do you insert a cassette in here? Well, the answer is you press eject in the screen. When you press eject in the screen, the cassette player below the screen actually opens up, which I just think is an amazing touch. <laughs> this car was way ahead of its time in terms of touch screens and infotainment. But it wasn't only the center screen that was interesting in this car. You also had a screen behind the steering wheel where the gauge cluster would be in a traditional vehicle from this era. And there are quite a few interesting items in here. Now in its natural position, this gauge cluster screen just showed you the stuff you expect. You have your odometer, your trip odometer, your fuel level, your current speed, all the normal stuff you'd expect from a gauge cluster but it went further than that. For instance, you can press the test button in the lower left of this screen, and then for about a second, all of the lights in the gauge cluster light up to let you know that they all work. But it also has the function of showing you what all the lights are. My personal favorite is the one that simply says electrical problem. <laughs> That's one you probably don't wanna have light up on you considering how much of this car is electronic. But probably the most interesting warning light in there is the one that says C Diagnostic Center. Check this out. 
I open up the door and then I put the car in drive and try to drive away. Instead of having a door open warning light in the gauge cluster, it says C Diagnostic Center with an arrow and points to the screen, which tells me that the door is open. So that C Diagnostic Center warning light actually alerts you to go look in a different place for the actual warning. Very interesting idea. And you can see that the gauge cluster screen and the diagnostic center screen really do talk to each other very unusual. Now next we have to move on to all the interesting buttons in the Riata and I'm going to start to the left of the gauge cluster. At the top you have a button marked lights. You press that and the lights turn on. Pretty simple. The interesting thing here is that this car has pop-up headlights so here are the lights popping up and then here are the lights popping back down. Not that unusual for a 1980s car but it has them and they're worth mentioning. A couple of interesting things about the headlights. When you turn on the headlights the reminder in the gauge cluster that lets you know they're on says halogen headlights on. It doesn't just say lights or have a picture of a light. It actually says halogen headlights. I'm not sure why, but it does. Another interesting thing about the lights over on that row of buttons to the left, you can see there's a separate button to turn the lights off and it is marked simply lights off. Now below that you have a little dial that says Sentinel with three options, off, delay, and high. This was what General Motors called the Twilight Sentinel. And it was a feature that basically measured how dark it was and then the headlights would turn on automatically when it got dark. We today call this automatic headlights. General Motors called it the Twilight Sentinel. Now you may be wondering what the delay feature on that is for. If you had it on delay, the Twilight Sentinel would operate like normal, but there would also be a delay in turning off the headlights when you parked your car so that you could walk into your house at night and the lights would still be on to provide a little extra security. But over on the right side of the gauge cluster, things get unusual again. Most of what you see on the right is your wiper controls. High, low, wipers off. One thing I like is the intermittent wipers are controlled with this little switch that says pulse min max and then you have to push the tiny little switch part to adjust the pulsing of the wipers. <laughs> Very unusual control but that's what I guess they did. One interesting item in that area though below the gauge cluster you have a button with a fuel pump and it says gauge. If you press that button it will zoom in on the fuel gauge the last quarter tank of fuel. So if you're really getting low on fuel you can press that button and see how low you really are and if you absolutely must make it to a gas station, the old fuel gauge zoom button. And next up, a couple of other interesting buttons in the Riata. At the base of the center control stack on the left, you have a button marked fog lamps. You can press that, turn on the fog lamps. It is not anywhere near the rest of the lighting controls. It's by itself. To the right of the fog lamps, you have a button marked lamp retract. Now, if you press that, the pop-up headlights will pop up but not turn on. The theory here is you would press this if, for example, you wanted to clean your headlights without turning them on, or if you knew a big freeze or snowstorm was coming and you wanted to open up your headlights before you parked the car at night so they wouldn't be frozen shut the next morning. Now, next, I'm moving down from those buttons, but in the same vicinity, I want to talk gear lever. This car has the famous General Motors gear lever with a button on top. You pushed it with your thumb and went through the gears. One thing I like is how they've explained what each gear is. You have park at the top written out, then reverse is next written out, and then the rest are all abbreviated. You have N, D, D, 2, 1. <laughs> They only felt it was necessary to write out park and reverse. Not sure why. Now in front of the gear lever, you have another very unusual control, and that would be the power window switches. These tiny, thin, silver switches will roll up and down the power windows. Very much unlike any other switches I've ever seen from General Motors vehicles from this era. They're very unusual, but they work reasonably well. Next to that, you can see you also have the mirror control. Nothing particularly unusual there, except for the fact that it's silver to make things a little more classy. Next up, another unusual item in this car comes in the sun visors. You drop the sun visor, they look pretty normal, open it up, you have a mirror, nothing weird here except the sun visor mirror light has two positions. You have bright and dim. So you could look at yourself or look at yourself a little brighter. Very strange place to have a two level lighting function, but the Riata has it. And next up, another interesting item. Over on the door panel where you'd expect to find the power window switches, you instead have the seat controls. You can see there are a couple of different switches and a little joystick for the seat controls. The joystick moves the seat forward, backward, up, and down, and these seats do still work. You can use the joystick and move the seat as much as you want. And next up, another unusual item in the Riata is the horn. To activate the horn, you press the center of the steering wheel, no surprise. The unusual part is how it sounds. Take a listen 
listen. Indeed, the Riata has the horn of a truck or maybe a cruise ship. Speaking of unusual sounds though, put on the turn signal and a reminder chime sounds along with the regular clicking noise. Take a listen. I guess they did this because so many old people in the 80s and 90s would just put on their turn signal and not hear the clicking sound and just leave it on. So that reminder chime was to let you know, hey, your turn signal is on, you should turn it off. And next up, another interesting item in the Riata. If you open up the center console, you can see there's this velvet lined piece with ridges. That's for cassette tape storage. That's where you'd stick your cassettes when you weren't using them. You can also pull out this piece and just have a normal center storage area where you can put more stuff. And speaking of more stuff, there's also another storage area in the glove box, no surprise. Open it up and you can put stuff in there. The most interesting thing about the glove box is probably the fact that it has the controls for the trunk and for the fuel door. The reason they're in here is to hide them from a valets or thieves. You could lock the glove box and then no one who got into your car would have access to your trunk or your fuel door if they wanted to steal gas because those buttons were contained within your glove box. And next up, another interesting Riata item is the brake pedal, mainly because if you look at it, it has printed on it the words anti-lock brake system. I guess to remind your foot <laughs> that you have an anti-lock braking system since you certainly won't be able to see those words when you're sitting in the driver's seat. Another interesting Riata item, this is the factory key fob. Take a look at this thing. It is pretty worn at this point. You can't see what any of the buttons do, but they all still work. You can lock, unlock, open up the trunk. And next up, we move on to the area behind the seats in the Riata. This is a two-seater car, but there's a fairly large space back here, like in the Mercedes-Benz SL, where you can put stuff. And in the Riata's case, you could put even more stuff here because there are storage compartments. You can see behind the passenger seat, there's this little lockable storage compartment. You can open it right up and stick stuff there. Same deal behind the driver's seat, a little lockable carpeted storage compartment you can put stuff in for additional storage if you want to keep more stuff out of the way. Now, in one of these storage compartments, I discovered the original owner's manual for this car. Nothing particularly unusual or interesting in here, except that in the owner's manual pouch, there's a card where it says, insert salesperson card here. This is a pristine Riata owner's manual pouch, never touched by the salesperson's card. Personally though, when it comes to Riata literature, I prefer this. This is the original Riata sales brochure from when this car was new, and it's pretty interesting to look through it. On the first page, it kind of explains the theory by the Riata. I read all this, and basically what it says is, Americans love the romantic ideal of the two-seater, but most two-seaters are hard to get in and too tight and too sporty and too expensive, but the Riata solves all those problems. It's a two-seater, but it's comfortable and relaxed and easy to drive and not tremendously expensive and it's the antidote to all those annoying two-seaters. The thing I really like about this original sales brochure though is if you keep turning, you have original Riata artwork that shows the hand assembly team putting one of these together. And it is really nice looking pieces of artwork that show the Riata team hard at work. I like that. And next up, we move outside the Riata and I wanna start with the trunk, which I will open with the key fob. And once you get into the trunk, you will discover that it is quite large, which very much goes along with Buick's theory of making a two-seat coupe that was more practical and luxurious than other two-seaters. The one problem with the trunk, though, is access height, because you have to lift whatever you're putting in here over this giant lip, and it's hard to get stuff all the way in here. And the reason it's such a challenge is this rear light bar. This light bar goes across the entire rear end of the car. It says Buick right in the middle. And the owner of the car told me it has 11 different light bulbs in it in order to light up the entire light bar. So those would eventually go out and you'd be changing light bar light bulbs all the time. Or you would just leave them burned out and there would be random dark spots in your Buick light bar. Interestingly, light bars are making a comeback with modern cars. So one could say the Riata's design was ahead of its time, at least in that aspect. Now, next up, another interesting item with the Riata was badging. As you can see back here, 
You have a Buick badge right in the middle, but aside from that, the rest of the car mainly said Riata. You have front and center on the hood, for instance, an R, which was the Riata logo, and it mainly says Riata pretty much everywhere else throughout the exterior of this car. And also, when you open the door, the door sill says Riata, not Buick. The center of the steering wheel has the Riata R logo, and even the glove box says Riata in large print, and then by Buick in small print underneath. The Riata was really intended to be kind of the next generation of Buick, showing the way forward for the brand and leading with this new special Riata. And speaking of the future of Buick, let's talk two other important Riata items. One is styling. This car was supposed to be futuristic. That was the intent Buick was going for with this look. It was far more aerodynamic than anything else General Motors was making in the time. It had no grill in front. It was a totally new look intended to signify a totally new Buick. Unfortunately, things weren't new under the hood. You had the typical General Motors 3800 V6. This engine was used in varying capacities and evolutions in literally millions of General Motors cars over the years, and in the Riata, it just wasn't very inspiring. 165 to 170 horsepower made it to a four-speed automatic. It just didn't really motivate this car very much. The new styling and the futuristic technology and the marketing and the brand of Riata was all way ahead of the powertrain, which was just simple, old school, boring General Motors. Now, two other interesting items worth noting up here, both related to lighting. One, the pop-up headlights. If for some reason they don't pop up, you can open up the hood and there is an emergency little dial you can see that allows you to twist it and that will raise up the pop-up headlight manually just in case for whatever reason your headlight hasn't automatically popped. It's like a backup manual headlight popper. The other interesting lighting item up here is the cornering lights. When you put on the turn signal, take a look, there's a white light that also goes on along with the turn signal. They called these cornering lights, and the theory was if you were signaling to the left, you were probably going to the left, so maybe you wanted a little more illumination over on the left side to see what was there, and so every time you put on your left signal, the left cornering light came on, your right signal, the right cornering light came on. This was actually a pretty good idea, and modern luxury cars are starting to bring it back. When you turn the steering wheel on some modern luxury cars, there are little auxiliary lights in the bumper that light up just like these cornering lights did 30 years ago. And so those are the quirks and features of the 1989 Buick Riata. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Riata. Uh, unfortunately, the driving experience of this car is the low point. The technology is cool. The marketing and the positioning of the car is cool. The story of the car is cool. The driving experience being a front wheel drive, four speed automatic, 3800 GM from 30 years ago, not really all that special. With that said, I am thrilled to be behind the wheel of this car. I'm really happy that I was able to find a nice Riata to shoot. Uh, this one is a little dirty on the outside because it rained yesterday, but it is really the nicest Riata, especially because that screen works. Obviously, in a lot of them, uh, it doesn't anymore. And one important component here, the Riata is one of these rare cars where it's, it was important for me to find an early model year because Buick later decided that the screen was too costly or too confusing, and they removed it for 1990. So only the first two model years of the Riata even have the screen. After that, they just went with normal buttons and switches, I guess. So how does it drive? I'm gonna floor right here. It's actually not so bad. It's not that slow. 165 horsepower was the number. Uh, it later grew to 170. It's not a fast car, certainly, but it's peppy enough. Can keep up even with modern traffic, no problem. Can drive on the highway, not really an issue. But it certainly is not exactly fun. So for people who wanted a two-seater because they wanted to have fun, this wasn't really the car. And if you wanted kind of a luxury car that was practical, this wasn't the car either because there were only two seats. One thing I must admit I am a little surprised about is steering and handling. Um, the steering is vague on center, but but after that, it's pretty direct and reasonably connected. And I'm a big fan of precise steering feel, and this car doesn't do such a bad job of it. The handling is also not so bad. It's a relatively small car. You're not gonna throw around corners like a rear-wheel drive mid-engine sports car, but it's more fun 
fun than you might think uh, when you drive around in it. I also never really loved the look of the Riata. Um, it was intended to be futuristic or like an 80s person's take on what they thought would look good in the future. Frankly, I don't think it does. Not really an attractive car. Uh, and it definitely has not aged well. Definitely looks outdated. And so that's the 1989 Buick Riata. This is a rare and special car, although not a particularly valuable one. Even the nicest Riata in the world is probably only worth 10 or maybe $12,000. But it is nice to check this car out and see what General Motors thought the future would look like 30 years ago. And now it's time to give the Riata a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, I've never liked the look of the Riata. It's fine, but that's about all I'd say, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Acceleration, it's quite slow. It does 0 to 60 about 10 seconds, and it gets a 1 out of 10. Handling is better than I expected, but still not great, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Fun factor is fine. It's not especially fun for a coupe, but it steers well, and it's acceptably enjoyable, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Cool factor is pretty low. For years, these were uncool, an old people car that failed, but it's gaining more interest, and it gets a 4 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 17 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. The Riata was advanced for its time and it gets a 4 out of 10, which is really strong for a car from this era. Comfort is average or a bit above and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is only okay, not great, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality, normal for a two-seater car like this, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Value is only okay. These are cheap, but they don't really deserve to be expensive. They're not particularly fun or fast or even really all that rare. Still, they're cool given the price, and the Riata gets a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 24 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 41 out of 100, which places it here against other somewhat similar cars from this era. Truthfully, the Riata was a flop because of uninspired performance and odd styling, and that still remains true today. But oh man, that touchscreen and other futuristic tech. It may not be an especially cool car, but it's certainly fun to look back and see what the future looked like in the late 1980s.